excited about love in here? Anyone? Woo, yes. It's going to be a sexy panel. Uh, I remember when we used to make fun of things like Craigslist misconnections and, uh, in my case, arranged marriage from my mom. But uh, things are changing. My friends are meeting and getting married online. So this uh, panel is a panel of founders who are tackling intimacy and dating and love. So it's not just a question of how people will find love and intimacy in the future or, you know, booty call, whatever is your preference, you know, no judgment. Uh, but what are the business models? How do we make money from this? Like, what's going on? So I can't wait to hear these predictions. It will be really, really cool. Uh, you've got, uh, so, so why don't we welcome up all of the panelists first, and then I will introduce oh. the moderator. So come on up come here. On. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the good things and the bad things that may be. Let's talk about sex. Let's talk about sex. Panel indeed. Okay, I'm gonna let them get to it. Uh, I want to introduce your moderator, Cyan Bannister, and uh, we'll give her applause in just a second. Uh, she uh, she is the founder and editor in chief of uh, Zirti. Is that Z Zivity? Ziv Zivity. Sorry, Zivity. Zivity, which um, some may call controversial, right? Indeed. Indeed, and adult in nature, and some would say it's an amazing business idea. So uh, she also uh, was voted at 22 as the sexiest geek. Is that correct? That is correct. I think you're pretty sexy <laughs> now, too, and geeky. So you got it going on. Uh, a writer and contributor to TechCrunch. And uh, she uh, is a prolific angel investor with her husband. So please welcome our moderator, Cyan Bannister. Give her a round of applause. Thank you. So to ponder the future of dating, I think I, it's very helpful to always look to the past. So when I was thinking about this panel today, I started thinking about my grandparents. And um, my grandparents dated in the early 50s. And um, if you think about that, that's only 60 years ago. And probably in, until I was about a teenager, not much changed in dating. You often met people that you lived near, uh, went to school with, saw at a coffee shop, and your choices were fairly limited. But with the invention and the adaptation of web-based internet and the tools that we have today, dating has changed drastically. And so now, not only can you meet someone um, like you, you can meet someone in several time zones away, you can meet people who have the same interesting genetics as yourself, you can meet people um, have the same interests, and so you can narrow things down quite a bit. And so, <clears throat> so basically, one of the things that I want to talk about today, um, going from the past, we're going to come back to the present, and we're going to talk about what you are all working on today. We have three amazing entrepreneurs with three very different businesses that we're going to talk about today, and then we're going to talk about the future. Um, so I want to take a moment and actually have everyone introduce themselves. Hi everyone, my name is Darwin Kang. I am the COO and co-founder of Coffee Meets Bagel. Um, so I don't know how many of you have heard of Coffee Meets Bagel, but our vision is to make everyone's dating life really seamless. And we do that by providing our members with highly personalized, high quality dating service, but in a really fun, gamified way. Um, I started Coffee Meets Bagel with two of my own sisters about a year and a half ago. Um, and before that, I actually have a pretty traditional background. So I worked at two corporates, very large corporation, Avon Products and JP Morgan. I also have an MBA from Stanford. Lori? I'm Lori Cheek, the founder and CEO of Cheeked. And Cheeked is like online dating, but backwards. So if you spot an intriguing stranger in your morning commute, in the subway, at the gym, or even in an elevator, you can simply slip them a cheeked card. On one side, it says, you've been cheeked. And on the other side, there's an ice-breaking pickup line, such as, act natural, we can get awkward later. Or there's one that says, I'm hitting on you if you're really subtle. There's one that says, I just put all my drinks on your tab. So 
And then there's a URL and a unique code that leads to the online dating profile of the person that phys physically slips you that card so they can find you online. It's like a privacy protected business card for dating. And uh, I'm an architect by trade, I'm from Kentucky, and I'm no longer building structures, I'm now building relationships with Cheeked. Awesome. And I'm Sheree Winslow, and I'm an advisor for Before We Do. And Before We Do's mission is to reduce um, sexual transmitted disease transmission uh, by giving people a way to test easily at home. Um, my, my background is actually in consumer packaged goods marketing and executive management. And I uh, was one of the founding members of a company called Integrated Marketing Services. Um, I decided to leave that company. And um, I went out, I found a, a job, I hated it, um, went and talked to an executive career coach and decided to uh, really pursue two paths in my career. One is um, in leadership positions within startup and then also in writing. So very ironically, I'm working on a memoir about everything I learned from a horrible romance. And I don't know how I ended up on a panel discussion talking about anyone's love lives because mine is a disaster. <laughs> but, but here I am. Awesome. So um, anyone who wants to answer this first, um, while your products are not gender specific, do you think that being a woman and having a woman's perspective has helped shape your products and why? I definitely think mine has. I, I don't look at women as really being the aggressors in, in initiating a, an introduction to a romantic partner. So I feel like just personally from my experiences, spending half my adult years as a single New Yorker, passing people every single day that could have been my soulmate and without a, a tool to kind of walk up and say hello. I mean, what I've done is based on my own personal experiences, I've built a tool that allows people to kind of break the ice and also protect your privacy as a woman. And how many women have adopted your product so far? So we're all over the world. The, it's non-gender specific, but I do like the stats that we're 49% male and 51% female. So it's apparently working for everyone all over. Awesome. What about you, Dylan? Yeah. So I I, I do also agree with um, Lorian that that it is really important to have women working on this product because I think fundamentally, depending on our gender and sexual orientation, the way we actually date, the way we want to date, is fundamentally different. Um, whenever I explain this, I like to share this um, little experiment um, that my sister got, got to know during our days at HBS. Um, there's this professor, his name is Mishek, and um, he did a, he's an expert in social networking research. And he did a, um, extensive research on what is the most popular activity on Facebook. And not surprisingly, it was a photo viewing activity. That's the most popular activity on Facebook. But what was really interesting is what type of photo viewing activity was, was um, the most popular. So the most popular photo viewing activity was straight men viewing photos of a woman they didn't know. And the second most popular was straight men viewing photos of a woman they did know. <laughs> the third was a straight woman viewing photos of a woman they knew. And the fourth was straight woman viewing photos of a woman they didn't know. <laughs> And so the funny thing about this study is that there is no one looking at photos of men. Um, <laughs> and if you think about a lot of 1.0 generations of online dating sites like the Match.coms, it's mostly sort of predic predic predicated on search and browse model where you're sort of browsing photos and photos of attractive people, hopefully, that you find relevant. And for a lot of guys, I think there's a lot of entertainment value driven from that. Even if they're not really relevant to you, it's entertaining to sort of look at photos of attractive women. But for a woman, you know, looking at photos of, even if they're really attractive and gorgeous, <laughs> unrelevant men, it kind of dies quickly. It's not really relevant activity that we really actually find it funny. And I'm obviously stereotyping here, but generally speaking. <laughs> and so like, things like that sort of, I think, illustrates how fundamentally we differ in the way we want to date. And I think more women being involved in this industry is a good thing because um, we can come up with products that really actually appeal and meet the needs of, of the woman and the way we want to date. Shree, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, well, 
while testing for STDs is not something um, that's just for women, the truth is that there are higher rates of growth in um, diseases like HIV amongst women. And so we do need to um, put greater focus on educating women about their sexual health. And we also need more content that is built about women and women's bodies and their sexual health and their sexual health needs. So that's certainly something that, um, that you know, I can And do you have any, any data on your customers, like who's buying the at-home testing kits, or is it mostly anonymized, or? We don't have, a, we don't have data on that yet. Do you think that women um, prefer to do at-home testing based on what you know? I think everybody prefers to do at-home testing versus going into clinics. It's very awkward. And um, one of the things that we did uh, a few months ago is we just interviewed a lot of people about their experience in testing in clinics. And um, it's very much stigmatized. People feel um, they feel bad. There's um, feelings of shame or guilt about why they're being tested usually. And, um, and so I think for everybody, it's less awkward if they can test at home. And one last question, because your business is very fascinating to me. Um, how, how many people in the world have STDs? So um, I, I don't have the worldwide number, but I can tell you that in the U.S., uh, there are 110 million STDs. So look at the person on your left, look at the person on your right, and statistically, one of you has an STD. That is how prevalent STDs are in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry if I, all, I just freaked you all out, but, um, but it's, it is important. It's a very important issue. It's, it's important for people to understand the prevalence of it, and um, too often uh, people are not detected, and that's why it, it continues to spread. So, um, people really need to understand what kind of an issue it is, how widespread it is, and um, just the importance of testing. One of the things that we're trying to promote is that um, because it is so prevalent, we need to re remove some of the stigma. It is a health issue. And there are lots of health issues that are um, treated without some kind of weird emotional reaction. And um, we should treat STDs the same way. Um, if people uh, find out that they have HIV early, they can get on a drug program that really helps them live a decent life. And um, we really want to help people get the treatment that they need. That's awesome. I think that there's a lot of stigma, probably not necessarily in dating, but maybe in my grandfather's time, online dating might have been stigmatized. Um, but, uh, I, you know, one of the things that I was uh, very motivated to get up here and do this panel was because I would really like for entrepreneurs in the audience um, if anybody is even remotely motivated to start a business um, in this category, I think uh, we need more brave people and entrepreneurs in general, but women and, and adding a female perspective, I think, is, is really important. So, on to the next question. Um, you mentioned stigma uh, around testing. Has there been any stigma related to your businesses or any challenges that you faced um, related to your businesses at all? And this could be, this is a broad question, it could be like, you know, business challenges. It doesn't have to be stigma. Wow, where do I start? <laughs> I think there are different challenges startups face almost every day daily. Um, and it really depends on um, the stage of your company. You know, when we were, you know, back this summer, we were fundraising, it was, that was a challenge. Um, when we first started, so I mentioned earlier that I started this company with two of my sisters. and. My background is business. Uh, my other sister's background is product, um, product marketing. And then my older sister is designer. So we did bring a very diversified set of skill set, but we actually didn't have a tech founder. And so um, that was actually very difficult. And I, I'm sure a lot of tech startups face a very similar issue. And even to this day, it's actually really difficult to um, be able to recruit tech talent, especially women. Um, we are a company of eight people right now, and three of us, the founders, are, are women. And uh, we have five engineers, all of which are, are men. And so, um, kind of a little bit of shameless pitching here, but to the extent that I know this is a really, really talented um, room of people, if you guys are women engineers interested in dating, I'd love to talk to you. Um, and so that's actually one main challenge that we're facing. We've, we've been trying to recruit this you know, good iOS engineer for our team right now, but. Really, it's just been really difficult. 
So that's an interesting point that you brought up, and you may not know the answer, but why is it difficult for women to recruit technical talent? Well, I think just statistically, I mean, if you look at the numbers, there are just very few um, and woman and fewer women engineers out there than, than men. Um, it kind of reminds me of, you know, I used to, before Coffee Meets Bagel, I used to work in banking um, at JP Morgan, and um, it is a very conservative firm, and even though they sort of do a really good job trying to reach out to recruit minorities, it is... It is also true that you know when you're there, you kind of feel left out, right? Because you are always sort of um, conscious of who you are just because you're a minority. And I wonder if that's um, sometimes very discouraging for people who are already kind of entering this field to actually even stay or enjoy. Um, and so, yeah, for that reason, probably why it's really difficult to recruit tech talent, especially women. Thank you. Any challenges you face, Lori? I, it's, it's almost the same thing. Uh, I did re recruit a tech talent based in London when I first launched about three and a half years ago. And soon after launch, I was fortunate enough to get covered on the style section of the New York Times. And it said, moveovermatch.com, this is the next generation of online dating. It was amazing. Um, but come to find out, my tech talent in London had the button ticked off that captured the credit card. So imagine I'm signing all these people up based on that New York Times article that crashed my site all over the world and I lost everyone's credit card to put them into the recurring subscription model. So based on my average lifetime user, I lost about $30,000 in the first six months of my business. So it's been kind of a, <laughs> an uphill battle since then and I joke now that that, that web developer is lucky he lived in London. <laughs> and Shri? Um, so some of the challenges we face are um, related to uh, other external factors. So um, one is that we're, we've got a service that people um, can get paid for through their insurance. And um, some of the laws are changing now because of the Affordable Care Act. But um, we have to sort of follow uh, the healthcare system to make sure that people can get their at-home testing reimbursed. So that's a, a challenge for us currently. Um, and then I think the other thing is that we've got some tests that we can currently send to people so they can test at home, um, but we're waiting for FDA approval on other tests so that people can have their, um, their total sexual health tested and taken care of at home. Awesome. So we went into the past 60 years, thought about that for a little bit. I want to go into the future. I feel like we're living in the future right now. If you just think back like 10 years, what we have today, it's kind of unfathomable that we carry around these massive computers in our little pockets. Um, but where is dating going? You know, I started thinking about Google Glass and dating. And, um, you know, you think about all of these rich profiles full of data. And, you know, my grandpa didn't get to look up my grandmother on Facebook and see who her exes were or what her you know, favorite music was or what she did last night. Um, now we can actually stalk people and find out information privately about them before we date them. So that's really interesting. Um, in Japan, they do blood typing uh, where people are really interested in each other's blood type. There's, you know, STD testing, uh, genetics testing. Now you can try to figure out if you're compatible for having children before you even date. And, um, you know, now your, your current partner can have contact with your exes as well. So it's very fascinating what we have now, but what about the future? Where is it going? And um, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? And, you know, what should we watch out for? So I have an opinion on this. Um, I, w what I've done with Cheeks is kind of trying to take the technology out of finding a mate where you actually meet this person in, in real life first. And I feel like where we are right now, the obsession with our phones and, you know, looking down at all moments, you're, lo you're losing the opportunity of meeting the love of your life that could be sitting right in front of you. Last summer, I was on vacation in the Hamptons and I didn't have a phone signal, so I stopped playing words with friends. I put my phone in my bag. I looked up and there was a hot man in front of me and he said, nice tattoos, and I decided he needed to get cheeked. So we <laughs> met for the drink that I invited him on the cheat card and we got engaged seven weeks later. So I know it works and it was just looking up. It was seriously putting the technology down. And I'm with cheeked, I'm just trying to take the online dating back to the streets. And I do feel like 
where online dating is going, it will be a more organic experience in meeting someone. And imagine seven years from now, I would like to create this technology where it's a visual device, some like a Google Glass, where you have a match that's coming near you and some, something says, the love of your life is walking right in front of you. <laughs> and then you, you could both have a light that lights up and then you can just say hello because... You're the love of my life. Yes, exactly. What a great story. Anyway, hopefully in, in a decade, I'll, you'll, you'll see me launch that. That's awesome. I'm, I'm married, but I downloaded Coffee Meets Bagel, and I gave it a try, and I hopefully I'm not upsetting anybody. Um, amazing user interface, by the way. I was able to sign up within uh, just seconds, and I really like the micropayment model. It's pretty cool. Um, how do you think um, you're addressing current needs, and, and what is the future for Coffee Meets Bagel, and how do you address the future? Yeah, so, so for me, um, I, I think I have a pretty similar view with Lori. Um, I think in the future, the delineation between online dating and offline dating is going to disappear. Or it's going to be so blurry that you're not going to be able to tell if you met somebody through online dating or offline dating um, because it feels more organic. Um, I recently attended this mobile conference back in San Francisco where um, one of the panelists was talking about how e-commerce has become so, um, online, online shopping and offline shopping experience has so become so um, intertwined that it's really hard to tell when online shopping experience begins and when offline shopping experience begins. I mean, if you go to the store, you find an item that you like, you look up online in case you can find some, the same product in, in a similar or cheaper price point, and you find it, you look at the reviews, you can either actually choose to buy it with, with on, online, sort of, um, using your mobile phone, or if you find that the store had an actually cheaper price, then you can actually buy on, in the, at the store. You know, what would you call that, right? Is, was it an online shopping experience or an offline shopping experience? I think very similar thing is happening already and will continue to happen in online dating. Um, you can meet somebody at a party uh, that your friend threw, and then you, you know, because it's awkward and we don't actually do this anymore, we didn't, you didn't ask, um, exchange phone numbers. And so you, you don't really have a way to get in touch with this person. You get on Coffee Meets Bagel or any other, um, some other online dating sites and then you meet this person. You're like, oh, hey, we met at this party. Um, do you want to meet up? You, you set up a date and then you, you meet up. Did you, did you meet him through online dating or offline dating, right? It's very hard to tell. And I think it's going to be so seamlessly integrated with your daily life that the term online dating is actually just going to disappear. We're not going to label that any, anymore. And I'm hoping that Coffee Meets Bagel is going to bring us um, closer to that. Yeah. Can I just say one more thing? Absolutely. That the one pair of shoes that I bought on Zappos in my size seven and a half didn't fit when they showed up. And I look at online dating like that person looks like you might be a fit, but when they show up, it's not quite what you thought you were gonna get. So well, I think something's gotta change. Yeah, I think a lot of people, um, per what you said um, in a conversation we had earlier, which you can talk about now, is that when you hand somebody one of your cards, you know what you're getting, whereas online dating maybe might be a challenge that you face. Um, people put up their absolute best photograph um, or someone else's photograph, and um, <clears throat> sometimes have their uh, friends fill out their profiles for them so that they can leave these really glowing reviews. I've done this for my friends. Um, <laughs> it's worked. So um, I think that that's one interesting thing about your product, and I think it's really interesting how different uh, the two of you are. So, um, but Shree, do you have any comments? Or? I, I think that, um, and I certainly hope that the discussion about STDs becomes easier and that people do have that discussion before they have sex. Um, that, you know, as, again, as we talk to people, they're still so awkward about um, having a really important discussion that they should have. And there are a lot of tools out there now that help people to share their STD test results so they know what they're getting into um, before they have sex. And hopefully that will um, just become common. So what problems um, don't exist now that might exist in five years? So when, you know, when our kids look back at us, because we look back at our, you know, I reflected on my grandparents, but when our kids look back at us and our grandkids look back at us, what will they think that's really funny about what we're doing today? Would Google Glass be funny? Would it just be a footnote in history? I mean, I, I read an interesting article in USA Today, believe it or not, um, 
from 2010, they coined that as the year that we stopped speaking to one another because of this whole thing with our with our handheld. And I mean, even when I'm out at a bar, I'll look at the, these kids that are out drinking together and they're looking at their phones and they're talking about what's the activity that's happening with their friends on Facebook. Like, I don't know, it, I think kids in the future might think it's weird that we actually used to talk to one another. I don't, I don't know what's gonna happen. Those people use their mouths, it was crazy. <laughs> Maybe they'll have to get robotic thumbs because mine are about to uh, wear out or maybe it'll just be tapped into our brains and we can just think, I don't know. Um, so sexuality, is technology going to change um, our openness about sexuality? It's something that plagues me is that um, my business is considered controversial and that really bothers me because I don't consider it controversial. I think the, the human body is one of the most beautiful things in the world and I think we should celebrate it and I think sexuality is core to who we are as human beings. I mean. We, all of us, every single person in this room, wouldn't have got here into this world unless someone had found a partner through whatever dating mechanism and had sex. You know, it's one of these things we just don't like to talk about, and I don't understand why. Um, so, you know, what do you guys think about technology? Will it open our minds? Will it open us to more to same-sex marriages, to different lifestyles? What do you think? Um, well, technology has certainly increased the ability for um, there to be shared information about sex. I mean, the internet is, you know, filled with porn. There's tons of content um, related to sex, but there's not a lot of great content related to um, sexuality that has been built by women. And so um, what I do hope to see um, improve is that there's um, more information about women, women's health, um, women's sexuality and that content being built by women and shared on the internet because there are issues that are specific to us um, and I, I, um, I, I'm at an age where I have a lot of friends who are having miscarriages so I'll, I'll just share this um, one example I have um, I had four friends last year who had miscarriages and um, with three of them I was one of the only people that they told about it uh, because you know it's a very um, sensitive topic and women don't like to talk about it um, all of them at the time that they were going through crisis tried to find information on the internet and had a very difficult time finding good information about um, what they were going through and uh, after the fact there continued to be um, after a miscarriage has occurred there continue to be a lot of problems related to it and it's just very difficult for women to find and share information with each other about what they're going through so um, well well that's not specific to sexuality it is specific to women's bodies and um, and how we experience um, you know our own health and so I do hope that there's just increased content and sharing by women about what they're experiencing. Dylan? Um, I definitely hope so and I definitely think it will um, bring us to closer to being open-minded and I think from online dating's per perspective um, where it can help and I think it's already helping is the fact that um, a lot of online dating companies including Coffee Meets Bagel and Tricked, it, it actually enables you to meet people more people who you would have otherwise never met um, or would have been very difficult to meet. Like take me for example, I moved to San Francisco last year and because of my startup, um, it's really actually difficult for me to actually make carve out time to go out. And unless I do that, I, I wouldn't be able to meet new people. But because of Coffee Meets Bagel, I'm actually able to meet a lot more new people than I would have otherwise. And you're just exposed to a lot more diversified um, group of people that you would have um, that is away from your normal sort of um, circle of friends, right? My sister, who's a very, very conservative Christian, actually um, ended up going on a date with another Christian guy who is very open about gay marriages and gay stand. And now he, she has a very different perspective um, because of him, and they're not really dating or anything because of that interaction. Um, she, you know, she thinks twice uh, about that issue, the particular issue. And so just enabling people to interact with, um, a group of people who are outside of their own circle, I think will bring us closer to being more open to about this kind of issue. Awesome, and did you wanna comment at all? Okay. And finally, um, these lovely women traveled to Vegas uh, 
to be on this stage to talk to all of you, but they're also interested in meeting some of you. And so who are you hoping to meet on their journey towards the future after this panel? Lori? Well, I'm looking for users. So uh, I brought a small stack of trial cheat cards. If anyone wants to tweet out about cheat, then you can come find me later and I'll give you a mini deck of these cards you can try yourself. But you have to be single. And um, I'm also looking for an amazing business development talent that can join my team. Sheree? Um, anybody who wants to talk to me about before we do, please um, come. I'd love to share more information with you about what we're doing. Um, but I'm also here as a writer, and I'm working on an article that helps to encourage girls to go into the technology field. So anybody who wants to be quoted in that um, or has specific advice about um, having you know, young girls take a technology uh, path, I would love to talk to you. Dawoon? Um, for me, as I alluded to earlier, it's really difficult to find great tech talent, and I know this room is full of talented people, so to the extent that um, uh, you guys are interested in sort of dating space, I would love to talk to you. And also, um, on the other hand, I know how it's also very difficult as a non-tech person to start a tech company, and I was in the same situation a year and a half ago, so to the extent that that is um, you, and you wanna talk about that, I'd be happy to share some of my thoughts as well. Great, thank you everybody so much for your time, and uh, thank you all. We have 10 minutes for uh, Q&A oh, on the panel. Awesome, I see so, hands. Uh, so we, this time our runners are ready and willing to run. So one, there's one runner here. Where's the other runner, the other mic runner? Oh, okay, you're right here, sorry. Okay, so they will come around uh, and there's someone with their hand up there and you can ask questions. Please stand when you do. Um, I have a, oh sorry, go on. <laughs> you go first. Okay, thanks. Um, as a Coffee Meets Bagel user, I'm curious where the name came from. Um, okay, so it was a combination just in this room. It was a combination of, of, of us trying to find a domain that is available, to be honest. Um, <laughs> but, but it was also because, um, as, as a user, I'm sure, so just uh, to let you guys know about how Coffee Meets Bagel works, for those of you who are not familiar, the way the service works is every day at noon, you get one match, we call that a bagel. Um, so you get a bagel every day at noon, one bagel, and you have 24 hours to like or pass this bagel. And if, there, if there's a mutual like, you like this person and your bagel likes you too, then you're connected and we provide you with a private phone line so you don't have to give out your phone number or any other personal information. So you can chat and hopefully meet up. So that's how the service works. And what we wanted to do was create an excitement every day at noon, something that people look forward to. And because our target audience was young professional, we were like, okay, what is the one thing that young professionals look forward to every day? Well, coffee break. And so we thought about the concept coffee and we were like, oh, okay, what is another thing that goes really well with coffee? We chose bagel because we started in New York City. So that's the origin of the name. Hi, my name is Natalie Villalobos, and uh, I have a question for the Before We Do founder. So I was recently reading an article, and I was trying to find it on my phone before I got up here, and they were talking about how teens actually aren't using condoms or really being mindful of STDs. I'm interested in how you're going to branch into a younger market, because I know that when I was a teenager, I had to awkwardly walk into Planned Parenthood to get anything that I needed. and. Mm. You know, when I look at ways for teens to ac access technology, there's vending machines uh, with, you know, like via Mac adapter, you know, at the airport. You know, where are the ways that we can make this more accessible so that teens can go and get this type of technology, you know, this type of resource, so that they can start taking that into their own hands and becoming informed, and even offering recommendations on how to handle what they might discover? So th that problem is um, somewhat specific to where teens are in their mental development. So in the same way that they take risks in other areas of their life, they take risks se sexually. And um, it's not that, you know, condoms aren't made available to them, they can get them anywhere. It's that they are taking a risk just like they might with drinking and driving or mm -hmm. drug use or, you know, any other number 
of risky behaviors. Um, so the, the best that we can do is work to um, really provide a lot of information and again help people to understand how prevalent it is um, and help them to understand that, you know, just like, just like we did here, um, help them understand that, you know, if they look at the person on the left and the person on the right, one of them probably has an STD and it, amongst teens it might be even higher, so. Hello, um, I run a bucket list website and on that website uh, you can make things private and a lot of times those private things are in fact relationship related or sexual. Um, but by marking them private, it doesn't match them up to friends or people in the area that potentially have that same goal. So how would you recommend that I reach out to those people and promote that they are potentially missing out on some matched activities um, without embarrassing them and preventing them from using the site going forward? Maybe Dewoon? Um Okay, so just to get it straight, you run a, you have a business with a bunch of um, people put in their bucket list and um, one of the things that they actually want to make it private is their relationship status. Well, it's kind of like their, their bucket, the things they wish they could do There's in life. Sexual bucket list, sexual bucket list maybe. Yeah. Um, maybe you could do something like Crushlink where you let them know like, hey, someone has a matching bucket list item to you. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's actually a good idea. So um, even in online dating, like some people, actually a lot of people even today is a little bit embarrassed about the fact that they're joining a dating site um, because they don't want to sort of put it out there that they're looking for somebody, right? And um, uh, Sheree can talk a little bit more about the sexual health part. Um, and so making it anon anonymous actually really helps. Um, so one of the things that we actually implemented recently um, is, so we have this concept called virtual beans, um, coffee beans, and it's, it's a, you actually get it when you invite friends, and that's actually one of the uh, ways we grow our, our member base. Um, and what we decided to do is to actually let people know um, how many of their own friends are actually using the service. We decided to, every time your friend joins Coffee Meets Bagel, you don't, we don't tell you who they are, you get, a, you get 50 beans. And so a lot of our users actually who thought they were the only one using Coffee Meets Bagel were really pleasantly surprised by all these emails that they were getting, like, oh, your friend's doing Coffee Meets Bagel, your friend's doing Coffee Meets Bagel. And then you start to think, oh, actually, this is kind of like normal thing to do because all my friends are doing it. And so to the extent that you can find some kind of mechanism that sort of makes them feel like that is the norm, um, I think it would really help. Do you have any statistics on how many of the people on your site have sexual items on the bucket list? And this will be the last question, by the way. I, I mean, I think writing a, a blog piece about that would be a great thing to do to help share with, with people, you know, that this is very common and, um, and a normal behavior and a normal thing for people to want. And um, maybe just even sharing that information would help. Hello. <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm Nina Uguomo. I'm the founder and CEO of The Student Dream. And we're a nonprofit that erases socioeconomic um, poverty through innovation education. And so as new entrepreneurs, my question, or as established entrepreneurs, my question to you all is, when you first started out, what were the hardest, what were the main jobs that you had to do, and which one of those were the most difficult? I can start first. Um, so I, I, in the intro, I alluded to the fact that I have a pretty traditional background. So I worked at very large corporation. And um, one of the challenges, main challenges that I faced sort of jumping into startup is that there aren't that many resources available to you for you to use. And so I'm so used to, you know, doing, taking all the time, taking all the money and resources to actually, you know, get, it, get up to like 95% of the certainty about, yeah, this is the right way to go. Versus when you're at a startup, you're, you're, you know, everything is kind of you're doing on your own. And you have to start somewhere, so you kind of have to take the leap of faith. Um, I think that mental shift was really hard for me to sort of get used to. Um, and I, if, I mean, you're already an entrepreneur, but there's a book um, called um, 
the Lean Startup Method, which I'm sure everyone knows, now we actually sort of take that as a Bible to um, do anything we do. Like, we don't assume anything. Um, even if we believe that just putting it out there and collecting data as much as possible versus doing all this theoretical research to sort of make you feel better about certain action is a lot better way of executing things. So, you know, just getting, getting in the habit of like putting things out there on um, prototype, even if it's, 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 you think it's crap, just put it out there and ha see how consumers react and you can iterate, um, build upon those learnings. I think that's actually um, one of the main lessons that I learned from the very beginning that was hard to sort of get used to, but it is super helpful. Lori? I would say, I mean, I've made every mistake you can possibly make from day one. I was an architect, had no idea what I was doing building this business, and the most important thing I wish I'd had was someone watching me from the beginning that just pulled me aside and told me, you know, just five things of what not to do or what to do. But in the end, it's it's about having the, the right people around you. So like a talented and trusted team. And I know that's not like a, a job, but when you do that, then the delegation and the jobs kind of merge together. It's just like finding a, a happy relationship. But I think it starts from the very beginning. And I, I wish I'd gotten the right people around me. Um, yeah, it would have changed everything. We have uh, 20 seconds left. Yeah. And similar, similar thought, I think resourcing is um, one of the biggest challenges. And um, because at first you are doing everything yourself, it, you, you, have to, you have to learn to sort out what you should be doing on your own and what you should um, find somebody else to do for you. And I think learning, um, you know, what those, where, the, where those resource breaks are is really important. Thank you.